Welcome to Boundary Training at First United Oak Park for 2021. This video is for those of you who couldn't make the live boundary training. We're going to start by talking a little bit about COVID procedures and church school, and then we will get into our standard boundary training. So first, COVID procedures. Right now, masks are required for all those two years and older who are entering the First United Church building. And masks are required for all volunteers, regardless of their vaccination status at all times when working with minors, whether you are inside or outside, you are required to have a mask on if you're working with minors. You're also required to be vaccinated. Um, this says regardless of vaccination status, just as a reminder that even though you are vaccinated, you will need to wear a mask. <clears throat> For our church school programs, registration is required and leaders will have access to registration information. And then this is a little bit about church school. So if you are a youth advisor, this does not apply to you. But um, Families will enter the lounge and proceed to a check-in station. At the very beginning of the year, we'll be outside. So families will actually enter um, the patio, the outdoor patio, and check in there. Um, <clears throat> there'll be hand sanitizer for um, adults to check in children on a computer, and the child will receive a name tag, and that will come with stickers. Um, and the stickers are a pickup code so we can match the uh, child to the right adult when we send them back. Um, no students will be dismissed on their own this year. Um, and there will be check-in assistance available to help with tech issues. And then this is also related to church school. <clears throat> when we're inside, parents will walk the student to the door of their classroom. Seats for students will be marked ahead of time. Um, when we're outside, seats will be marked with hula hoops. When we're inside, chairs or tape or mats. Um, if snacks are provided this year, they'll be individually wrapped in a paper bag. Um, children can now sit three feet apart instead of six feet apart. Um, it's wonderful that, that um, the health department changed that guidance. Um, <clears throat> children will remove their snack from a paper bag, put their mask in the bag, eat the snack, put the mask back on, and put the snack wrapper in the paper bag to throw it away. So they won't be allowed to stand up until they have put their mask back on. When we're inside, music will include movement and instruments only because indoor singing is still not permitted um, for houses of worship, group indoor group singing. But um, when we're outside, we will be able to sing during music time. And when we're inside, we have a maximum of 18 students per room. Um, and anything that we use will be sanitized. So those are our COVID procedures. And now we'll move into boundary training. Can I say a little about the COVID procedures for like the youth groups? Yes. Really quick. Awesome. Okay, so just um, the mask uh, guidelines that Lydia just outlined at the beginning of those procedures are also true for um, the youth groups. Um, so masks will be required regardless of vaccination status, um, whether we're indoors or outdoors. The only difference in the procedures of um, like drop offs and things like that is since we don't have little kiddos, they don't need stickers. Um, but we will have a check in process where uh, you're going, instead of doing individual COVID symptom check questionnaires, um, we're going to have a poster of those symptoms to review, and then you're going to like sign a log. Um, all youth and advisors will be doing that. And then we are also still requiring that one time um, uh, COVID um, waiver and release of claims. Um, and so we'll have those on file. And then uh, we will have hand sanitizer and disposable masks 
um, and all of that available, as well as uh, cleaning wipes to clean things as um, we use them. And we will also be doing social distancing as much as possible, also using hula hoops and things like that when we're outside. Um, but we will also be doing things indoors occasionally as um, numbers and space allow for it. Um, so like Lydia said, there were limits on numbers of folks in rooms. Um, so we'll just have to take that into account. Uh, but mostly these activities are going to be weather permitting um, until at least the end of October, we hope. Um, and then we'll reassess at that time. Thank you. All right. Now we're going to move into boundary training. If the slides will advance, there we go. So first, why are we doing this? Why do we have boundary training? We have ethical obligations to protect the minors in our care. We have religious obligations. We have legal obligations. We know that boundary violations have happened here and we wanna make sure that we are all on the same page about the best way to prevent any boundary violation from happening. So take a moment where you are and make as extensive a list as you can of all the boundaries that you have observed at First United. Think about boundaries that define spaces, boundaries that define relationships, and boundaries that define time. Should we name some? Yeah, let's name some. Um, time is one of the ones I feel like we don't often think about. So um, there are certain times that the church is open and times that it's not. Um, and certain like groups and meetings happen at certain times. And particularly in a pandemic situation, that um, means other groups can't be in that space during that time and for a certain amount of time afterward while it's being cleaned. Um, and the church itself has been broken into zones during the pandemic. So very, very clear boundaries of this is the nursery school zone, this is the church zone, and this is the beyond hunger zone. Um, those are some big boundaries these days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we have boundaries uh, around, you know, offices have doors that lock. Um, our financial records live in a in a room that locks. And in um, cabinets that are locked. In cabinets that are locked in a room that locks. Um, we have um, relationship boundaries. We have expectations about how we'll treat each other. Um, which is what covenants are for. Mm -hmm. um, we have boundaries that are roles. Some people are um, in leadership roles and there's a, there's a boundary between those who are leading and those who are participating um, to define. There's a definition between what your job is and what my job is. Um, so those are all boundaries. So thinking about that, are boundaries a gift? Why or why not? And I think um, sometimes when we think about boundaries, we think about what is set in place to keep people out, and we don't think of that as a gift. But there are also boundaries that are set to um, keep us and others safe. And those boundaries are absolutely a gift. And so what we're talking about in this boundary training is boundaries that are set up to keep especially the most vulnerable in our congregation safe. So um, here's, here's the example of that. Um, you think about a boundary as a gift. 
um, the dog on the right certainly sees this boundary as a gift. Uh, this is a quote from an old tobacco farmer. You can put the dog out and tie him up or you can build a fence and let him run. And so our goal is to build a fence and um, be able to run within that space, to do our ministry, to have a safe space in which we can do all the things that we, um, that we need and want to do rather than feeling tied up. Um, this is our, our way of um, giving ourselves freedom within safe limits. Want to read some scripture? Sure. Uh, so this um, points to that list of why do we do this and um, we, our religious obligation of how in our scriptures we are called to provide these healthy, safe boundary spaces for those among us. And so we see in Micah 6, 8, God has told you, O mortal, what is good? And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? This is our, our justice work of, of protecting and providing safe space for the most vulnerable among us, our children. And um, Isaiah 117, learn to do good, seek justice, rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. Again, our call to protect and provide um, care for the vulnerable, the, the little ones. Um, and Matthew 18, 5, 6, whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were fastened around your neck and you were drowned in the depth of the sea. So one of the more extreme scriptures um, of our call to provide um, care and protection for the vulnerable and the little ones, but uh, just kind of shows how serious um, Jesus wanted us to take this call um, of our discipleship. Uh, yeah. These are some um, myths about um, abuse of minors. So one is that it's only abuse if it's violent. Um, and this is thinking physically violent. Um, that is not true. There are all kinds of abuse. There's emotional abuse, psychological abuse, religious abuse. Um, there are, are all kinds of ways that someone can use their power and control for harm. Um, only bad people abuse children. So uh, this is the myth that I would recognize someone who was abusive when in fact um, that's not the case. Um, it's often really shocking and very upsetting to find out who has hurt a child because it will be sometimes a pillar of the community. It might be a very trusted um, scout leader, Sunday school leader, pastor. It's often a, a very trusted adult because they have um, gained enough trust to have access to, to hurt. Child abuse doesn't happen in good families. Um, again, this is that same myth that I would recognize it if I saw it, and that is not always the case. Um, all kinds of families experience abuse within them. They look all kinds of ways to the outside world. Um, there's something that abusers do called grooming, which is um, uh, either grooming the child that they intend to abuse by being really wonderful and kind and caring um, and, and doing special things for the child, but there's also grooming character witnesses, which is making it so that the community believes you are just the most incredible person. You're just such a wonderful person and you're so good with the kids. Um, and so, um, this happens with the family member that is abusive. This happens with the, with the scout leader, with the church leader. Most abusers are strangers. This is just absolutely and completely false. Most abusers are 
our family members, friends, trusted leaders. Um, it's the swim coach, the the scout leader. It's usually um, someone that the child knows very well. Um, in the 80s, when I was a child, there was a lot of talk about stranger danger. Um, that's all well and good, but it's actually not the biggest threat to children at all. Um, another myth, abused children always grow up to be abusers. That's absolutely not true. Um, abused children um, can grow up to be absolutely wonderful, caring, loving adults. Um, and then abuse can't happen here. We're a safe community. It couldn't happen here. And that is just not true. We're going to talk about what the risk factors are for um, abuse happening in a church community. So here they are. Trust leaders implicitly, lack of adequate screening and training, frequent close contact between adults and children and youth. We hope that folks trust leaders and we want there to be frequent close contact between adults and children and youth. We want our youth advisors to be there every week for our youth. We want our church school leaders there every week for church school. Um, these are things that, that are both really good things and they, they are risk factors. Um, and lack of adequate screening and training, of course, we do our best to eliminate this risk factor, which is why you're in this training right now. Um, but uh, we know that that we are at risk. Um, and so we have to do our best to, to mitigate our risks um, while still doing our ministry. So, um, Abuse is about power and how we use power. So it's important that we think about power and vulnerability. One way to think about that is in a car. Um, and we've got some pedestrians on the left and a driver on the right. Um, so who has the right of way? The pedestrian kitties. Thank you, Alicia. <laughs> the pedestrian kitties have the right of way. Why, Alicia? Oh, because they are pedestrians. They're not in a car that mm -hmm. could, they're going to get hurt. <laughs> yeah, they don't have the protection of, you know, a ton of steel around them. And they um, can't move as quickly as a car. They don't have a motor. So they're more vulnerable. There we go. So then there's someone here who is at risk to do harm. That crazy looking cat yes. behind the wheel. Yes, the, the, the cat behind the wheel, the driver is at risk to do harm um, because the driver has the power. The driver has a motor, the driver has the steel, the driver has um, more resources, so the driver is at risk to do harm. So power is having greater resources. Having greater resources means you have the potential to abuse those with less power. And so you have a responsibility. Vulnerability is having fewer resources in a given situation. And therefore you have the potential for being abused by those who have more power in that situation. And so um, just to flip the language on its head a little bit, I like to talk about the rules of the sea. Um, the rules of the sea are the rules that that um, motor craft on the water, watercraft, is that the word, have oh, to yeah. follow. Um, in the rules of the sea, uh, it talks about speedboats, boats with motors as the burdened party, which um, is is strange because speedboats have the power they have control of their movement but that means they're obligated to protect sailboats boats without motors so they're the burdened party that's the language in the rules of the sea 
Now, sailboats or boats with no motors are talked about as privileged, the privileged party. Um, that's a different way to use the word privilege than what we normally do in our everyday speech. Sailboats are at the mercy of the wind. They don't have as much control of their movement. They can't move out of the way of a speedboat as quickly as a speedboat can come at them. So they're really vulnerable. Um, and so they have the privilege of being protected by boats with more power, with the resources. Um, I just, I think twisting that language around and using it differently gets us thinking differently. Um, it's still important that we think about privilege the way we typically do in our world, thinking about white privilege, male privilege, all of those privileges. It's really important that we think about those things. But to, for a moment, turn the language on its head and realize that if we have what we commonly think of as privilege, what we actually have is a burden, a responsibility. We are responsible to protect those who are more vulnerable than us. So what attributes of power might you have when you are working with a youth group or when you're working with a church school group? Um, your race might be an attribute of power, your gender, your sexual orientation, your economic class, your physical size, your physical health and ability, your age absolutely is, you are older than the students you are working with, um, your mental health could be one, one factor. Um, all of these are relational, they're all contextual, they change from place to place. So when I'm in the pulpit, I have um, power there, I have the microphone, I get to say the words I want to say. Um, when I'm in the dentist chair, I'm vulnerable. I have no idea what the dentist is doing. The dentist has a drill. Um, the dentist has all kinds of knowledge about my teeth and my gums that I don't have. So um, it's contextual. One moment I might have lots of power and the next moment I might be quite vulnerable if I go from preaching to the dentist chair. And this is a good, just to point out for our youth that serve as church school leaders and who are also in youth group, that it is contextual. So you may have more power in your role as a church school leader than you do as a youth in the youth group. But just to remember, at, even as a church school teacher, you're gonna have an older adult with you um, in that space. So even in that one role, you're going to have some more power than those you're working with and less power than um, the church school teachers who are overseeing that too. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about how power is having more resources. And um, so that is morally neutral. Now we can talk about there are times when people have more resources because they did something immoral. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but the kind of power we're talking about is morally neutral. The fact that you're older than a child, that's morally neutral. You've just been around longer, you can't help that. <laughs> um, all persons have vulnerabilities and attributes of power and privilege. And like we said, that changes with context. But children, minors, teenagers have less power and more vulnerabilities than adults, period. So when you are working with students, you are the burdened party. You are older. And so you are, you are the one with more power. So you have the responsibility or the burden to use your power to care for and protect the students that you're working with. So a few quick scenarios. A child or teen motions for you to come and talk to them in the stairwell. Are you vulnerable or are you at risk? Yes, Alicia. You're, you're at risk. You are at risk. Now, those of you playing the home game might have thought vulnerable <laughs> because common usage of vulnerable, I feel vulnerable. We say that 
when what we mean is um, this is an uncomfortable situation because I know that I could hurt someone. So you as an adult standing in a stairwell with a teen, you might think in your head, I feel vulnerable right now, but what you actually are is at risk to do harm to that teen because you have more power in that situation. You could say to the teen, I would love to talk to you. Let's go to the lounge. Or you could say, um, I would love to talk to you. Let me um, grab Alicia and then we can chat here. Uh, you have the, the resources to change the dynamics of the situation to make it safe for that teen. And yes, that teen is safe with you in the stairwell because you don't intend to hurt that teen. But we have um, these boundaries in place because we know that the, someone wants to hurt that teen. And we, we don't know who it is. Um, so uh, you refusing to talk to that teen alone in the stairwell communicates to them that that's not an okay thing for someone who intends to hurt them to do. That's not a space that you want them in because they're very vulnerable if they're alone in a stairwell with an adult. Another teacher threatens that if you tell anyone he asked a child to give him a back rub, you'll be in trouble. Are you vulnerable or at risk to do harm? That one sounds complicated. Mm -hmm. This one does sound complicated because there are multiple factors of power and vulnerability here. But thinking about the child that got asked to, to um, give an adult a back rub, you have the power and you are at risk to do harm because you're at risk to let that continue and progress. Um, so uh, if an adult leader is doing something that you think, ooh, that's kind of, that, I'm uncomfortable that they asked a child to do that, um, then you have the power and therefore the burden to do something about it. You can come to me or Alicia and say, this is what I saw. It didn't feel right. Um, and thereby protect that child. Now, maybe this adult has more power than you. Maybe because of race, gender, sexual orientation, um, finances, status in the church, this person might have more power than you. And you might think, ooh, if I go try to tell on this person, there might be repercussions. Um, and you might feel vulnerable in that case. Um, and that's understandable. <clears throat> but thinking about the most vulnerable person in the situation, it's the child, it's not you. A child is alone in the bathroom and calls for you. This is the same as a child or teen motions for you to come to the stairwell. You have the power to say, let me grab someone else, or what do you need in there? Um, and, and figure out a way to not end up alone in the bathroom with a child. A teen who is physically stronger than you makes a sexually explicit comment about you. Are you vulnerable or at risk to do harm? Again, it feels kind of like uh, complicated, like the second one, but still you're at risk to do harm um, because you're you're the adult in the situation with more power. Um, but I, for, I forget what you said in the first boundary training that I liked how you um, wrapped this one up. Do you remember what you said? I don't, but I think okay. I would say that... Um, the this teen made a sexually explicit comment they did not physically assault you if the teen had physically assaulted you you would be vulnerable to them but the fact that the the teen made a sexually explicit comment about you you are at risk to 
maybe like that sexually explicit comment and come back with something else and and um, and have an inappropriate relationship with that teen, right? Worst case scenario. So um, this is a case of um, there's one attribute of power that this teen has, but it does not in this situation, this context, outweigh your power as an adult to say, that comment's not okay with me. Um, so you, you have the power still. A teen only lives a few blocks away and asks for a ride home from youth group. At risk to do harm. Similar. Alicia, it's just so easy to just drop this kid off. I know. I'm so sorry, but I'm not because I don't want anyone to be at risk over vulnerable. <laughs> and we, and this has been a common thing that has happened. And, um, you know, we have adults uh, and leaders in our church who are like, I'm their next door neighbor. I've watched them since they were young. But we all wear different hats. And one of the hats that you wear here at the church, if you're in this boundary training, is that of a church school leader or an advisor. And when you're wearing that hat, we, we really, really need you to abide by and, um, you know, follow our, our rules and guidelines here for these maintaining these boundaries, because it's really for the protection of our children and youth, but also for your own. Um, and it really, even though it's easy, it doesn't, that's, it's not worth it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is a really common youth group situation. It's also a place where boundary violations have happened. Um, one of the kind of most famous uh, clergy abuse cases was a youth group um, leader driving a kid home from youth group and he sexually assaulted her. Um, became a rather famous case when on national television. Um, and this is just such a common thing because it's so inconvenient when you're waiting for the parent of the last kid standing there to come pick them up and you know you could just drop them off. Um, so this is a good example. And then when we're thinking about uh, crossing a boundary, um, here is the, the legal part. Um, what would a jury pool expect us to do if First United were brought to court for a child abuse case? What excuses might we make and how would those hold up in court? So like that last example, it was really inconvenient for us all to stand around and wait. So we just told Jim to drive him home. Well, that doesn't stand up in court. We didn't follow our own policy. Um, or, um, oh, the, it was just the scheduling was really, really hard. And so we couldn't get that person in boundary training. That, that doesn't stand up. We didn't follow our own policy. Um, really, there are no excuses we can make that are going to hold up if we aren't following our own policy and um, doing our due diligence to keep uh, our children and teens safe. And then test questions. If you're thinking about crossing a boundary, think about the impact. What's the impact on this individual that you're about to cross this boundary with? What's the potential impact on this congregation, um, on our shared mission, on our multicultural setting? And multicultural is there to remember that um, boundaries are contextual. And so, you know, maybe for you, this thing is okay, but maybe for this other person, it's not. So what's the impact here that, um, that you would be having if you cross this boundary? And even you made the example earlier of like, even if that impact is not you're harming them yourself, if that impact is you're then communicating that that situation is okay, 
that is harm right there. Um, Cause then we're leading our children and youth astray to say, yes, this is an okay position for you to be in again. And with another adult who we don't know or trust. Um, so that's, that is harm um, to put that in their mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You wanna talk to us about oh. our boundaries? Our boundaries. Um, okay, so our safe church policy includes um, our guidelines for working with minors, um, training and screening, which is one of the things you're doing right now is your training and screening is we do background checks. Um, reporting procedures, and then the response plan. So these are all things we're gonna go through together. Um, so our guidelines for working with minors, um, anyone working with minors must complete a criminal background check every three years. And we are just now switching our uh, background check system. Um, so we're redoing all background checks. Um, just to get everyone on the same page. So even if you did one in the last three years, you're going to have another one. Um, two non-related adults must be present at all times during any church-sponsored class activity or event involving minors. Uh, so this is why we don't have um, a married couple or siblings as the leaders of a church school class or um, a, a youth advisors alone with, with the kids. Um, and then there may be no child care or youth workers who are less than five years older than the minors for whom they are responsible. Yes, that requires some math, but we also just keep that in mind as we're recruiting folks to um, be church school leaders and advisors. Um, the youth church school leaders, that number doesn't apply um, as we have two non-related adults who are um, overseeing that. So no worries there. There may be no child care or youth workers who are under the age of 18, except when supervised by two non-related adults. So that right there is the our church school leaders that are youth. Um, if there is no window in the door of the room in which you are working with minors, the door must remain open. We do have some doors in the church that don't have windows in them. So just a reminder to keep those open. Um, no meetings with minors in secluded places. We've definitely covered this um, with the example of the stairwell and the car and the bathroom. Um, so just keeping that in mind and remembering that you can always bring in another adult or um, go to a different place uh, to, to meet. I'm sorry. That's all right. And do not enter a restroom alone with minors. So that goes with that too. Um, Receive written parental permissions anytime you are leaving the First United Campus with minors in your care. Um, we have done this for church school with uh, little permission slips, and this is kind of built into the registration, but also we do additional forms with the youth groups. Refuse to release minors to anyone but their parent or guardian unless you have written permission. So this is the stickers that the kids have for church school. Um, and again, this is the, our procedure for this is built into the registration for youth groups. Do not initiate physical touch with a minor. Do I want to say more about that? Because we just like, that sounds like don't ever touch anyone ever, which is a pretty good um, stance in general, especially during a pandemic. Um, <laughs> but if, <laughs> but um, sometimes we offer hugs in, in uh, the case of, you know, if someone's having a rough day, but there's a difference between saying, you look like you're having a tough time. Would you like a hug or, and grabbing someone and just giving them a hug. So yes, don't initiate physical touch with a minor, but we also consider the, um, those questions of, should I cross this boundary? Um, and our learnings about consent. So those are good things to keep in mind. Um, do not share close sleeping quarters with minors on over overnight events. This applies more so to the youth groups. Um, and so we do, we, we separate um, advisors and youth as much as possible. Uh, and or we just kind of have designated areas and make sure that we have enough adults in the room. Um, so 
Minors and adults must have separate bathrooms and showers or separate bathroom and shower times and overnight events. Again, mostly for the youth groups um, when we are having overnight events for the lock-ins or um, retreats. And sometimes we are able to have separate bathrooms, not always. And so we just have to keep in mind those separate times um, and uh, work on having the kids respect those times. Um, Never allow minors to be in groups of fewer than three when leaving your direct line of sight. Uh, so growing up, I was always taught the buddy system that you always have one person with you and that's how we were sent out into the world. Um, but we function with this uh, rule of three so that um, first, if there is an, uh, a dynamic of any peer-to-peer -peer abuse, uh, there is a third person there uh, to kind of witness and and uh, be there and can be a support back if if that needs to be um, discussed but then also um, especially on like retreats and things like that if someone is injured uh, someone can stay with the injured person and then someone can come and find help um, so rule of three the kids have really taken to this I've found and you know when I say like hey I need someone to go do this they're like can I bring so and so and so and so I'm like yes please please do that um yeah and then no one under the age of 21 may drive minors during church sponsored events adults may never be alone in the car with a minor um and also we require proof of current driver's license and auto insurance before that um happens and that's it. Social media guidelines. Um, why? Because it's the world we live in. Um, they are inescapable. The power and vulnerability is still at play, even on social media platforms, and we want to prevent abuse. So, um, even before the pandemic, these were in place, but it feels like they are even more important now since we do so much um, on Zoom and through different messaging apps and things like that. So um, adults should not submit friend or follow requests to minors. This is where you, you have the power, even when you're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Um, so it, it is not your place to submit that friend or follow request. Um, if they, I guess we'll just move to this one. Um, they are allowed to friend or follow request you. Um, but if you choose to accept that request, um, you are then responsible for maintaining the appropriateness of your profile. Um, and you must be willing to share all posts and correspondence with the pastoral staff of First United if needed or requested. Um, so keeping in mind that we will require that kind of communication, sites and platforms like Snapchat um, are not, not permitted um, because they don't live forever anywhere. Um, so we do ask that you retain all correspondence that you have with any children or youth um, so that they can be retrieved. And this is why we say um, only use public platforms when communicating with minors. Um, don't use social media for which you can't produce a record. Um, so, but like that does include like a Facebook wall that is public, but a direct message is not. It's, it's private. Um, if you are sent a private message, we ask that you include an additional person in the conversation because that is like being alone in a room with a minor. Um, so just keep that in mind. And that, that's true for texts and emails as well as the social media site. Um, and so we, you know, sometimes it'll be, I'll include Lydia on a text that I'm having. Um, if someone texts you about a serious situation and says, hey, I really need to talk to you about this, um, uh, you can easily, it may not feel easy, but you can say, hey, I really wanna talk to you about that. It sounds like it's really important or you're really upset. Can I please bring in Alicia 
or Lydia or someone else that you're comfortable with to have this conversation. Um, but if they text you, hey, is youth group at 6 p.m., you can say, yes, it is. Or you can respond, no, it's at 4.30 or whatever it is. Like a response like that um, is fine. Um, for official First United Social Media groups, uh, we ask that you use closed groups, not hidden groups. Um, and if, you, if these groups do exist um, or that you would like to start one, uh, we ask that both youth and adults are administrators. Um, closed groups uh, mean outsiders can't see anything that's posted, but hidden groups mean that no one can see that the group exists. And any inappropriate material that is not covered by mandatory reporting laws, which we'll talk a little more about, um, should be deleted from the site. Any material that is covered by mandatory reporting laws should be reported to Lydia, our Associate Pastor of Education, who will document that for church records, and then we ask that it be deleted. Any content that details inappropriate behavior outside of the bounds of the established covenant should be addressed by authorized youth workers and parents. Um, <clears throat> so we'll talk a little bit about mandatory reporting. Um, we are, as leaders, mandatory reporters. So um, in the state of Illinois, uh, if you are in an official capacity, which you are as a church school leader or a youth group advisor, then you're a mandatory reporter. That means if you see or suspect that a minor is being hurt or is hurting themselves, then you are obligated to report that for the protection of that minor. Um, and then see or suspect, or if it's reported to you by the minor, um, then, then you are obligated to report. So this is how uh, our process works here. Um, I wanna be a support to you if you receive a report. So um, come to me or, or go to Alicia if you receive a report of abuse or if you suspect abuse and you want to, um, to uh, and you need to do a report. Um, <clears throat> I'll ask you if you wanna be a part of this reporting call. I hope that you will. It's not an intimidating process. Um, it's simply a phone call and they'll ask, what did you see? What did you hear? And you just give that report. Um, and it's not, um, I think it might be, or I'm worried that maybe it's just, this is, this is what the child said, or this is what I saw. So, um, it's, it's simply a report. It's your duty to report, not to investigate. If a teenager comes to you and says, this is what's happening at home, um, we expect that you will not call home. Um, you can make things so much worse for that, that child if you call the parent and the parent finds out that that child has told someone else what's happening at home. Um, don't go to the uncle and see if you can get more information. Don't, don't seek outside sources to gather information on this. Um, that is up to professionals who know what they're doing. So we don't investigate, we just report and we let people who know how to do investigations do the investigating. You will not be held accountable for reporting a claim of abuse that turns out to be false if the report was given in good faith. So. If a child comes to church school with strange bruises week after week after week, then you, you report that. And if it turns out that it was something else entirely, that's not your fault. You did your, your duty, which was to, um, to report in case it would protect that child. Now, if a child or teen um, 
discloses to you and says, this abuse is happening. Um, often the first thing they'll say is, can you keep a secret? And so um, we encourage you to talk, if it's a teenager, talk about the difference between confidentiality and secrecy. I can't keep a secret. That means that even if you need help, I don't tell anybody you need help. But I can I can keep this confidential. I won't tell anyone who doesn't absolutely need to know in order to protect you. I won't tell your parents. I won't tell your friends. But I will make sure that we keep you safe the best we possibly can. And that conversation um, is a part of our covenant-making process. So we will talk about that with the youth. Yeah, so that's already set up there. So that can just be a reminder. If they say, can you keep a secret? You can remind them about the covenant. Um, with a child, this is a, a helpful phrase. Before you tell me your secret, know that if you tell me that someone's hurting you or you're hurting yourself or others, I'll have to tell someone who can help. Um, and there's a fear that if we say that, then they're going to clam up and not tell us. But by the time they say, can you keep a secret, they've chosen you as the the keeper of this information they've decided you're safe and there's just very little chance that they're going to turn back at that point um helpful phrases if a child or youth does tell you that that someone is hurting them i believe you i'm sorry this happened to you it's not your fault and let's work on keeping you safe those four phrases are the, the most helpful things you can say when someone uh, discloses that they are being abused. And our goal after we find out that there is abuse happening is to protect the victim. That's number one. That's our first priority. So the first thing we're going to do is make a safety plan with them, figure out how we can make it safer than it is right now and call and report the abuse. Um, goal number two is stopping the abuser, which we don't really have control over. We leave that to professionals who do that kind of thing. Um, and then healing, helping the, the survivor of that abuse heal. Um, if, if you suspect child abuse or neglect in your capacity as a, um, a children or youth worker at First United, um, come, we'll make the phone call. But this is just a great number to have on hand if in other parts of your life there, um, you, you see something, you hear something, you suspect something, you can call 1-800-25-ABUSE and someone will help you, um, will direct you to where you need to, to go. Want to go through the emergency procedures? <laughs> so emergency procedures, lockdown. Um, obviously, we're not spending a lot of time in our building currently, uh, but still good to know what the procedures are for when we do hopefully eventually get back into the church. Um, so uh, if there is a lockdown situation, because our building is rather old and we don't have um, like a PA system or anything like that, uh, you will most likely hear Lydia or I or John or someone else on staff um, running around yelling things like lockdown. Um, so please be <laughs> listening for such things. We will try to be loud. Um, if you do hear that, uh, we, your, your goal is to clear the hallways as quickly and safely as possible. Clear the hallways, the restrooms, and other rooms that cannot be secured. Um, so most likely you'll be trying to be in one of the classrooms that you can um, close and lock the door. Um, to the best of your abilities, you are securing and covering the windows and doors, moving people and kids away from the windows and doors. Um, and taking note of who you have with you, you're taking attendance. Do you, is there anyone missing that you are sure you were supposed to have with you? Do you have an extra kid that you found in the bathroom when you were clearing it and added to your group? 
Um, so just take note of that um, and report that to us once we've given the all clear. Um, so you're going to stay in place in your secured room. Um, do not answer the door. Do not respond to alarms. Um, listen for us running around yelling all clear. Um, that is how you will know that it is safe. And then let us know who your extras are, who is missing, and we can figure out where everyone is. Evacuate procedures. So in case of a fire or what would be another evacuation? Very unlikely earthquake. <laughs> something like that. But even that is like, don't you like huddle in a hallway or something? Maybe we need to add that one. But um, in the case of a fire or other need to evacuate, um, as quickly and safely as possible, um, line up the folks that you have, one leader at the front of your group and one at the back, and go to the nearest stairwell or exit that you are by um, and exit the building. And we are meeting at the corner of Kenilworth and Ontario, which is basically like the back corner of our parking lot. Um, and there, there you will take attendance and report any missing or extra people to staff. Um, and again, fire situations to evacuate will most likely be someone yelling fire um, or there it will be obvious that the there's fire alarm. smoke. Oh, we do have fire alarms. Oh, good. We should have those. <laughs> So nothing is more important than the physical, mental, and emotional safety of those in our care. No convenience, no enjoyment, no learning outcome. It's not worth it. That is the summary of our, our boundary training. Um, there's nothing more important than the safety and well-being of those that we are caring for. So think for a moment about what you've heard in this boundary training. Were there things you heard that you already knew? Uh, was there something you saw from a different angle? Did you learn something that filled in a gap for you? And is there a new direction that you will go or an action that you're going to take as a result of this boundary training? So this is our commissioning, and you get to be incredibly goofy wherever you are. You get to say this aloud, um, and anyone who happens to hear you can just wonder what's going on, um, because we're going to commission you, and you have a part to say, and your part is, I will with holy support, and we'll say it with you. So there you go. Siblings in faith, after spiritual and educational preparation today, it is time to send you forth to do the work of protecting the vulnerable of First United Church of Oak Park. If you are ready to commit to this work, please respond to the following questions with, I will with holy support. Will you use your unique gifts to practice and share what you have learned today? I will, I will with holy, with holy support. support. Will you practice and model healthy boundaries in your personal life and in your work at First United? I will, I will. with holy support. holy support. Will you make the physical, emotional, and spiritual safety of the most vulnerable among us your charge and your first priority? I will, I will. with holy support. In the name of Jesus, you are sent forth with good news that will make First United a place of healing and welcome for all people. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being a part of this boundary training and thank you for agreeing to serve as a, a leader in our children and youth ministry. And if you have questions or concerns, let us know. Look for information about uh, your background check if you are an adult leader. Um, so if you haven't gotten set up on Realm, please do. And if you need help with Realm, you can email office at firstunitedoakpark.com. Um, and Heather, our administrator, will be glad to help you um, get set up.
um, if you are teaching church school, then you will need to be in Realm because all of your information is coming through Realm. All of the church school registration is happening through Realm. So um, it's important that you're there. There are training videos on the First United YouTube page. Um, and so um, for church school, you'll be assigned to a group in Realm that will be your class. And you can um, e email your class through Realm. You can um, give resources to your class through Realm. Um, send pictures to parents of things the kids are doing. Um, you'll be able to do what you need to do there. Um, so it's important you're there. Um, what's the uh, status of youth group things with Realm? Well, I would say first as the church, we say everyone get on Realm just because that would be super helpful. Um, we are kind of, because uh, we didn't get a huge jump on Realm. Uh, this is kind of a transition year for the youth groups. Um, all of the groups that need to be in Realm are there, but we may not utilize Realm as much as we would like to yet. Um, a lot of our communication will still be through weekly emails and um, through GroupMe and things like that. But we do encourage everyone to have their profile and keep it updated on Realm. And that way we can easily make that shift um, next year to where like our registration process will be in Realm instead of a group, a Google form. Um, and that way it can all be in one place. And I think that will make everyone's lives easier. Um, uh, so yeah, and also then advisors, you would be given um, like leader uh, permissions um, in Realm of your, of either Fuji or Fush, whichever one you're a part of. And so you can also communicate that way and, and help keep the group um, up to date. And yeah, so just Realm is where we're trying to hold everything these days. And we have the ability to create events in there that will also send reminders. So that would be instead of like the group me events and we still have the ability to like chat with one another in there. Um, and it is, uh, an app you can it's the realm connect app too so we can easily use it from our phones just like we do group me mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, and if you are set up in realm and you um, want to get into realm you can do that by going to on realm.com anywhere you are um, i i talked a little bit about how the check-in process for church school will be um, a realm-based process. Um, the, the name badge that will print for the students when they arrive will have their name, any allergies so that you have quick access to see if you have a child with an allergy that um, you need to know about. And then the pickup code will also be there. I'm gonna move through this. Um, this is for church school leaders on Sunday mornings at 8.30. You will have access to the church school closet. Um, it's filled with all kinds of supplies. All of those are available to you every week. Um, starting at 8.30, that closet will be open. It's on the second floor in the education um, sort of wing where the nursery school um, meets. <clears throat> 